It's Hugh Ballou again. This episode of Orchestrating Success is still about connecting your passion to your profit. We all have passion. We all have expertise. How do we monetize that? How do we create a sustainable business model? And profit has a lot of meaning to that word. Um, so we're in profit in all of its forms. My guest today is a, a, a new dear friend in the new town where I live, the new city of Lynchburg, Virginia. Abe Lober. Hello, Abe. Hey, how are you? I'm awesome. Great to be here. That's good to have you here. And Abe and I connected the first day I was here. And Abe, I, I spotted him as being a very sharp businessman. And so, Abe, tell people a little bit about who you are mm -hmm. and what your background is. And, and in that, why do you have businesses? Okay. Okay. So I, um, my background is in almost everything. Ooh. And that's just a ridiculous thing to say. I understand. But I have worked in car sales and in real estate and in IT and for nonprofits. And I've done guitar lessons for kids, and I kept the books for a wine company for a while, mm -hmm. and uh, and I worked, yeah, it, 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 a lot of different things. So, uh, my degrees, my undergraduate degrees, are in literature and visual arts, mm. and found out pretty quickly that wasn't going to earn me much. <laughs> and so, sadly, sadly, I'm, I'm still passionate about those things, but I went back and got a, a master's in business, and then a doctorate in education. And so, a doctorate in education, yes. I'm finding out new things today. Keep going. <laughs> I hope you find out something else new. I mean, yeah. Man. I, <clears throat> um, so, so I, I do love to, I love to read. I love to try and look at things from new perspectives. Most of my, most of my arts degree was in sculpture. So very three dimensional. I like to rotate problems and see them from different angles. And so that has helped me to, um, to look at opportunities a little bit differently. I never intended to own a business. I did, never said I'd like to own a business someday. Wow. Uh, but uh, one day, uh, I, I, I learned that my favorite restaurant, my favorite coffee shop, had closed. Oh, dear. And I thought, well, somebody will buy that place because that was a great place. Somebody will reopen it soon. And six months later, it was still shut up. <clears throat> and so uh, I sat down and I had a conversation with the owner at the time. Um, who had recently closed it. And uh, and we talked a little bit about the books, about the reasons for the closure. And one of the things I decided when I was fairly young in life, uh, still in college, was that I just didn't want to miss good opportunities. I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life, but I didn't want to see opportunities pass me by. And so uh, I thought, hey, let me let me see if this sticks, I'm going to throw out a number, make an offer to buy mm -hmm. a restaurant, mm -hmm. never having worked in a restaurant. Oh, really? Uh, this number is going to be about as big as all the money I've ever earned, plus the sale of my car and everything I could scrounge up. Oh. And it was still a lowball offer to buy a restaurant. And so I, I put this number out and uh, without flinching, the previous owner said, yep, done. <laughs> and I thought, oh, shoot, I just bought a, I just bought a restaurant. <laughs> So, so that was, uh, that was, that was the beginning of me saying, well, I just dove in the deep end and I've got to figure some stuff out. So there you go. Wow. <clears throat> now it's still open. How many years ago was that? A little over four. Four years. And I go by there a lot. I stop in sometimes. Mm -hmm. I know it's a place I can get um, good coffee. This is a series of interviews I'm having in my new house on Fort Avenue in Lynchburg. And we, we have interviews around my coffee <laughs> and I'm known as the coffee snob, but uh, it's excellent coffee, by the way. It's uh, thank you. Yeah. I'm very particular about my coffee and Abe has uh, the best roaster. I, there's I think four or five roasters in this city and I'm very fond of your roasts. Well, thank you. Um, every roaster has their own particular roast. Mm -hmm. So you've created an identity that, that continued from the previous person's identity and mm -hmm. to to uh, establish a new identity. I'm going to pause that. I'm going to go back to this story of reinventing a business mm -hmm. um, because we talk to, I talk to a lot of people when I, I do keynotes and I do workshops and I travel the country. Uh, I talk to a lot of people who have great products, mm -hmm. great <clears throat> services, mm -hmm. really are not monetizing it and making the money that they really deserve to make. Right. So there's some missing components. So in this series of interviews, I interview, um, 
really good leaders. And you know, one of my secrets to leadership is uh, always hang out with people smarter than you are. So uh, that's why Abe is here. I uh, have learned something every time, every time that we've spoken. So pause the, the White Heart Cafe, is it? Yeah. Let's pause that story and come back to it. But you do other things too. I do. You do other things. You advise people on their, their big financial picture, don't you? I do. Yeah. So you're, you're, I work full time with Northwestern Mutual as mm -hmm. a financial. Uh, you said Northwestern Mutual. Yeah, I, I, I did. Yeah, I did. So um, as a financial representative, and that's uh, that's been a great experience. Awesome. Awesome. And you're a strong presence. And I, I see you at uh, events in Lynchburg where um, important people gather and you're just there sharing with people. So you're very much a giver. And, and I find that people that are very successful, A, they read. Mm. Readers excel. Mm -hmm. They do things other people wouldn't do. P people who are successful continue when other people have quit. Mm -hmm. You know, the three feet from gold story from Napoleon Hills. That's right. And, um, <clears throat> and they're very well differentiated. You do what you know is right. You don't follow yes. a pattern that you think other people want you to do. That's right. You fatter, you follow your own conscience, <clears throat> but you also have, um, and you teach too. I do. I teach in the uh, school of business for Liberty. Okay. Yeah. So Liberty you, University. you manage and, and you have never failed to have time to talk to me and hmm. you spend the time here and you manage yourself, your schedule uh, very well. So there's lots of indicators to me of really strong leadership traits. So I'm happy to have you on this podcast. Let's go back to the story of the white heart, because I think there's a story for all of us there mm -hmm. to, to see an opportunity, but not just to delve into what was, mm -hmm. but to reposition that. So talk about how you reposition this and made it yeah. profitable. Right. Well, the white heart was a great business. Um, I, I bought something that was very popular, mm -hmm. but that had closed, which seems counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> My goal was to figure out how much of all, everything that is great about this organization can I keep in place and maintain excitement about while pinpointing the, the areas that were just inefficient enough to sink what was a, a very cool ship. And so we pinpointed a couple of areas. We noticed that on the downside, uh, the, this is going to sound strange, but the food was very high quality. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is usually a, an upside, mm -hmm. but in this case, the the menu pricing didn't match, and so the margins weren't what they ought to have been. And if you wanted to make the margins what they should have been, you'd price yourself out of the Lynchburg market. Mm -hmm. So what we unfortunately did was we said, "Hey, some of this food needs to become a little bit more pedestrian, a little bit less gourmet for a very." old tiny pub downtown Lynchburg, Virginia. And so we kind of did this, uh, this process where I just kind of asked myself, what are the really popular places in town? I don't want to be like them, mm -hmm. but I can learn something from them mm -hmm. as far as uh, what people in Lynchburg really want to eat. And what I found out was they really love kind of old standards, burgers, fries, turkey club, omelets, basic, nothing, nothing fancy, nothing new, no, no fancy names, but we are going to do it better than anybody's ever done it. So we have the best omelets and the best turkey club, and uh, we were ranked second best burger. So I've, I've got some work to do there. Um, oh <laughs> so, so we're we've got uh, hands down the best fish and chips. So we're working on doing things that people are familiar with and that they love: mac and cheese, grilled cheese, these kind of things. That uh, that, but we're doing them better. So our mac and cheese has three cheeses and it's got a smoked Gouda and it's got a, a sharp cheddar and there's some special flavors in there, but it's still just mac and cheese. Okay. It's, it's nothing, nothing fancy. Um, and so learning how to, uh, I think how to appeal to folks who really are, are uncomplicated, uh, which I love um, in a way that's going to also be profitable was, was hard for us. And then on the upside, we said, we've got a great brand, an incredible location. We have a neat, old, historic building, the best coffee in town, a very, uh, a very good roasting machine. Uh, we can leverage these things to really put out great products. Mm -hmm. So we took everything that was great in the soul of the business. And then we said, hey, 
let's change our pricing model and product a little bit, just enough to, to keep ourselves above water. And then we, we did a couple of things like slap some new paint on, hired some um, unreasonably friendly people. I, I tell people that if you're not Chick-fil-A friendly, then you're not doing it right. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> because th they're the gold standard, right? In yes. the business, business yeah. and food service industry. <clears throat> and so, uh, and then cast a real vision and told all of our staff, you're here because people come not for a cup of coffee. If that was, if that's what they wanted, they could go to Sheets or McDonald's or Starbucks. Mm -hmm. um, they're here because they want a very specific experience. And it's your job to make sure that everybody who comes in here, regardless of their attitude, leaves here happy and feeling great about their life. And so we see ourselves as a filter for the whole city into which tired, grumpy people walk and out of which happy, energized people exit. And, uh, and our goal is to play that role in the downtown community. It's attitude adjustment. It is, absolutely. And our staff love it and they buy in. And yes, customer service is happening across the counter, but we also, uh, we don't withhold that same goal from our own staff. Your goal is to make the staff who you work with, the people who clock in next to you behind the counter horizontally, perform better, feel better about their lives, serve each other, and, and so they do. And the culture is unbelievable. And you're in um, the downtown area where there are a number of other restaurants serving very different menus that have um, a similar uh, a similar passion for customer service. I've found that uh, uh -huh. people in Lynchburg are very friendly. Mm -hmm. And some restaurants are very customer minded. Yep. I, we went to your place uh, one Sunday afternoon for a late lunch and uh, some piece of equipment had had, had a fire. So they couldn't, they couldn't do what I, what I wanted, but mm -hmm. I said, what else can we do? And so they quickly substituted and kept us happy. Mm -hmm. And they were very apologetic for something that they weren't responsible for. I mm -hmm. said, well, you know, it's all right. We just want to have lunch and we're happy to do something different. Mm -hmm. But they were very accommodating. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> I didn't mention I knew the boss. So they were accommodating anyway. I'm glad that you didn't. That's <laughs> great. You can be my secret shopper. It is a... Um, it's an old building with this wooden floor that's kind of creaky mm -hmm. and it's got a lot of character to it. It does. And, and so I heard a number of things in there. You didn't, um, you didn't go with the previous model cause it didn't work for the previous owner. Mm -hmm. And uh, I find people all over that want to deliver the quality they think people want mm -hmm. rather than understand what people really want. Mm -hmm. And they don't clearly define the margin that they need to stay in business. Mm -hmm. And, and then the culture, everybody in your, in your business that touches a customer represents your brand. Mm -hmm. and, and they know that. That's and consistent. They, they love that. They believe everybody there feels as though and behaves as though they own the restaurant. They have that ownership that I don't know how they got it, honestly. I mean, I, you try to, you hope, but I can't tell you how that happened but they come, they apply. People who apply are some of the most passionate people. Uh, they'll say, I applied here. You know, that's always the interview question. Why'd you apply at the White Heart? Mm -hmm, White Heart? Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to work with the White Heart. This place shares my heart. I'm here every day. I would, they're giving up much better paying jobs. I have, I have baristas who have master's degrees who work as baristas because they're thrilled to be part of what we're doing. Oh my. It's, a, it's amazing. Oh my. Um, they need to find other jobs. <laughs> well, you do help people. You, we, do, you do help people. I remember you yeah, talking about yeah. encouraging people to go upward in there. Yeah. I mean, we, we commit. I commit personally to everybody we hire that my goal is to move them into their forever job and to write their letter of recommendation when they move on. So I, I'm trying to help them in, to do something better. Um, and as you know, I spent um, many years, 40 years as a, as a musical conductor. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> we shape the culture. And the old saying is that um, the culture is a reflection of the leader. Mm. So I would say knowing you and knowing the principles that you have and the values you have, that that's, that's very true mm. for what I I've experienced as a customer and went there in you know, the first day we met, we met later and went, you took me mm -hmm. there for, for coffee that's right. <clears throat> and um, some of your famous bacon. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everybody loves the, you, you have to be known for something. Yeah. And uh, there was a time we, we have this, it's Chipotle cinnamon bacon. Oh, and it's, uh, it's got some, a little bit of spice and something sweet and it takes, I didn't think you could improve on bacon, uh -huh. but a friend of mine said, I've 
I got to show you this, this technique I've got. Let me show you how to do this. And there's some caramelizing of brown sugars on there and everything. And, um, and so it's really good. And uh, he made me the bacon. I said, oh my gosh, this is the best bacon I've ever had. We're definitely serving this. And, uh, and so for a while we had these bumper stickers that said, come for the coffee, stay for the bacon. Ooh. And, uh, and it was funny. I, I did them kind of as a joke, but we sold out in like a week. Uh, hundreds of them, just gone. And so one of these days I'll have to go get some more of those. But uh, people, that resonated with people. They love the bacon. Ah, isn't that, that's, I know that's, that's kind of silly, but, but bacon is a, it's a popular thing. People are into bacon right now. Uh, there's no carbs in it. So would you call that influence <laughs> marketing? What would you call that? Uh, if you would call it that, I would. I, I, would, I would just call it, um, I would call it trying to, trying to connect with, with our customers in some way. Yeah. You yeah, know, it's, yeah. it's, I'm not, I'm, I'm not as smart as you give me credit for being. I just look at my customers <laughs> and I look at my customers and I say, wow, what do I need to do to make these folks happy? And we have to constantly adjust because I have ideas and I say, hey, let's serve flatbread pizzas. Who doesn't want to come downtown and get a pizza and a beer for under 10 bucks? Yeah. And then we don't sell any pizzas and I'm taking up menu space and I've got, I've got products that I'm ordering and not a lot of, and the 10 people who order it think it's the best pizza they've ever had, but nobody's really ordering it right. other than right. those 10 people. Right. So you take it off the menu and try something different. And so we're constantly adjusting uh, to what our customers tell us that they want with their dollars, because what they say they want with their mouths is not always the truth. They tell you with their mouth what they think they want. I tell you with their dollars what they actually want. They vote with their money. Yes. Ah, that's that's the bottom line, isn't it? So that's a really critical point. I, I mean, a lot of people will say have really great stuff, but nobody's buying it. Mm -hmm. So have you interviewed, <laughs> have you talked to people? Have you, have you determined what they think they want? The pizza was something they thought they wanted. Really? And there was a survey done of young professionals, 20s uh -huh. and 30s in the downtown neighborhood. And uh, the one thing they said they thought downtown needed more than anything else was a place to get pizza and a beer for under $10. Well, I responded. Turns out they didn't actually want that as badly as they thought or my pizza wasn't very good. And maybe I was only listening to people who were saying nice things to me. I don't know. Mm -hmm. there, there's, there's some of that, right? We filter out discouraging things, especially entrepreneurs who tend to be optimistic and, yeah. Um, yeah. and independent. But, um, but in the end, that was, that was an attempt to listen and it was also a failure. And I, I blame myself for that in the same way I blame myself for the bangers and mash we did because it's a traditional pub favorite. And we had four guys who loved it, but nobody really ordered that. And so I had to pull it off the menu and just admit that I was wrong and think in the town might like that. But you know now. But I know now. That's right. So being wrong is it's really not being wrong. It's it's discovering what it's a learning opportunity for you. Discovering what does work right. by process of elimination. Well, uh, what's it? Uh, Thomas Edison said um, he found 9,999 things that didn't work with the light bulb. That's right. He never considered it a failure. That's right. <clears throat> so um, there's, there's a thread here for people that I meet that say, well, I've got this out there and, and people say they want it, but they're not buying it. So you virtually did what would be called online split testing. You, okay. tried, you tried this, you tried that, mm -hmm. and this one was the clear winner. Yeah. So you, you tried different things. <clears throat> We did, um, and then we stumbled upon some things too. So we got an accidental delivery of a bunch of turkey, <laughs> and it wasn't cold cuts, it was big, whole turkey breasts, and we didn't know what to do with that. And <laughs> I, rather than sending it back and, and getting our money back, I just I told, uh, told my, my kitchen manager at the time, I said, what can you do with a bunch of turkey? He said, I don't know, let me put something together. Takes the turkey, puts it on some, uh, some wheat toast with lettuce, tomato, uh, chipotle, cinnamon, bacon, and then he creates a little bit of spicy herb of mayo uh, and he makes it himself and he puts it on a sandwich. He says, here, taste this. Tell me what you think. Wow, that's an unbelievable sandwich. He goes, it's just a turkey club, except we're using a special herb mayo and special bacon. And the turkey's not cold cuts. The turkey is sliced right. turkey breast, uh -huh. stacked like at, right after a Thanksgiving kind of turkey. Uh -huh. And, uh, and I said, well, just make it a special until we're all out of our, our turkey breasts. Well, sold out in a day and a half. Hmm. I said, okay, well, 
The public just told us, they voted with their dollars, they showed us what they're interested in eating. So we've had that on the menu and it's been our best seller, seller now for three and a half years. Accidental success. Accidental. But you didn't send it back. No, I didn't. You saw opportunity. Try stuff. I didn't see an opportunity. I just thought, try it. I'm happy to try and fail. Well, obstacles <laughs> can become opportunities. Yes. Wow. wow. Mm -hmm. So go back to the culture. You have how many employees? 40? Right about 40. About 40. Yeah. Between that and the other little shop restaurants that I have. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, you you're didn't know about restaurants. Now you're a restaurateur with multiples. It's weird, isn't it? It is. I yeah. love it. I love it. You're an entrepreneur. Um, <clears throat> Entrepreneurs solve problems for people mm -hmm. and people want really good food. So mm -hmm. you're giving them good food mm -hmm. for that. We generate revenue. That's right. Um, and it's consistent. Mm -hmm. It's friendly. It's an experience more than just eating a sandwich. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a whole, it's a whole business model and, and you've partnered with the right revenue model, mm -hmm. enough cash flow, enough profit. Mm -hmm. So, well, and I, we do have, locally sourced organic items on the menu. I wish everything on the menu fit that bill. Uh -huh. But if it did, I couldn't, I couldn't sell it for what I needed to sell it for. Mm -hmm. So we have some local farmers that we're able to help because we can pay our bills every month. And if I weren't able to, to keep the profit margins what they need to be, keep the, keep the, uh, the business sustainable, not only do we no longer offer a great product and service to downtown, but we stop ordering product from local farmers. We stop doing advertising with local vendors. We stop paying the rent for our staff. Now, there are all sorts of things that happen if I'm not smart with the way I look at my books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so is that something that was intuitive to you to interpret the books or do you have a financial partner that helps you interpret? Yeah. That? Um, so basic, Big picture books, um, that's my responsibility. When we do advertising, what we sign contracts for, what sort of menu items do we have and how we price those, that's that's in my court. All of my payroll, all of my taxes. Uh, I have a CPA who keeps me out of jail mm -hmm. and uh, because I, I'm just not organized enough. Um, I'm glad that, you, by the way, you were talking about all these different things I do and the time I spend with you. And I was afraid you were going to say I was organized. <laughs> and, and, and the truth is I'm not. I, I know where my weaknesses are. And I think that's probably my greatest superpower as a business person is saying, you are just so miserable at these five things. You need to be paying other people to do that for you because you will sink yourself if you don't. And so some of those things are making sure that taxes are done on time and done mm -hmm. properly and making sure that payroll is done on time and done properly. Mm -hmm. That's time labor intensive. It's, I don't really have the, the energy for that. Probably don't have the ability to do it well either. Nor should you do it. Well, you're the leader. I think you're right. You're not the doer. So back on episode 13, around 13, I believe it is, uh, interviewed my friend Cal Turner. Mm -hmm. Cal Turner went to his, his top management at Dollar General. Mm -hmm. And he said, I got this job of president and CEO because of my genes, not because of my skill. But I have the vision for this company. You have the skill. Mm -hmm. We're going to go public. Yeah. And everybody stepped up. Mm -hmm. And he said <clears throat> to me, Hugh, leadership is about defining your gaps mm -hmm. and finding the right people to fill mm -hmm. those gaps. And our job is to hold a vision and to empower the team, mm -hmm. which um, I see that you do very well. And you are organized and that you manage yourself. Doesn't mean mm -hmm. you have to do the details That's and you, you know what you need to delegate. So mm -hmm. in, in, in the high sense of organization, you're very disciplined with that. You don't take on stuff that you shouldn't be doing. Yeah. Well, and I've had to learn um, for, for years where have worked on delegating, you know, because you, you have this idea in your head. If it's not done, if you, if you want it done right, you have to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. And and I don't believe that I've mm -hmm. come, come to a point in, in my life where I believe it can be done right. It doesn't have, it won't get done my way, but it can still be done right. My way isn't the only right way to get things done. And so if I put the right people in place who are honest, dependable, diligent, and positive, and those are my four non-negotiables for my staff. So, Hey, you're going to always tell me the truth. You're never going to steal from me. You're always going to be there when you're expected to be there. You're going to work hard while you're there. You're going to do it with a good attitude. I can trust you to do this. Even if it's not my way, you'll do it well. And, uh, and so we hire those kind of people and I can be hands off all month long. I'm doing a high five. Um, <laughs> I want to point out to my listeners who 
many have heard my my curriculum, and this is exactly what I teach. Hmm. And you and I did not prep, prep this. No, I don't know what you. I teach. didn't pay you money. <laughs> I teach people how to delegate in exactly what you define. Hmm. You know, this is what I want. You figure out how to get there. Mm -hmm. And here's the culture. You hire people to fit the culture. Mm -hmm. And you also have defined your principles. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where we set up conflict in any organization is we haven't really clearly defined how we behave, how we make decisions together. Mm -hmm. And so it's like um, Southwest Airlines. They hire for attitude and train for skill. Yep. You know, I probably you doesn't apply way. to pilots, but you yeah. know. Right. <laughs> they probably still want attitude though. That's right. And so, um, <clears throat> wow, this is a bonus. And, and it's perfectly, I have intuitive sense about people, but it's, it, it's perfectly in sync with what we represent at Center Vision mm -hmm. and the whole methodology. Um, I want to piggyback on a story you told me when we were sitting in White Hart that first time. I looked at your wall and said, mm -hmm. oh, this is really attractive. Mm -hmm. And you said, employees took the initiative. Mm -hmm. You remember that story? I do remember that. Share that, would you? We have, a, we have a really nice big fireplace with a mantle and a hearth, and uh, we've got high ceilings. They must be at least 12, maybe 14 feet high. Yeah. And, uh, and we had this big white stag over the the fireplace, but a lot of blank space on that wall. But we had paintings and pictures up around the restaurant and other areas. And one day I came in, it was the same week that I met there with you. And all of those pictures had been drawn together and placed over the hearth, a dozen of them, you know, uh, in kind of surrounding this, this stag head. And I thought to myself, man, what are they doing? Uh, who nobody asked my permission to do this and I, I I in the moment I was offended I thought you, you, you don't just redecorate without asking me if you can redecorate because you're not sure that's consistent with our brand and then I calmed down for a second and I said <laughs> called my manager over I said who did that he was like some of the other folks and I understood in the moment that he wasn't worried that lower level employees had taken it upon themselves to redecorate my restaurant. Um, and I had to learn from him that I don't need to be worried either. They're doing that because they're in there 60 hours a week. Um, I'm in there three hours a week. They know what customers want to see. They have an, a certain aesthetic. If it would have been really terrible, I would have said, take them all down and rearrange it. But it wasn't. It was just different. It was, again, it, it was different than what I would have done but I trust my employees. And, uh, and so I said, you know what, just leave it up. Let's see what happens. And we've been complimented multiple times. I love what you did, Abe, I love what you did with the, all the artwork up above the hearth. Well, you know, that wasn't me, right? So it's, that was everybody else. Wish I could take credit for it. I'm not smart enough to have done that. <laughs> I'm just smart enough to have gotten out of the way when somebody else wanted to do it. Well, huge rule of thumb is hire the best people have very clear directives, mm -hmm. very clear principles, and then get out of their way. Mm -hmm. We want to have um, we want to have uh, <clears throat> expectations. Yeah. Like what do we expect people to do as a performance side, which is another missing component. But um, I the coffee is I heard him say it's the best coffee in Lynchburg. I would validate that unless you're at my house, um, <laughs> and I don't have as many choices as you do. Um, and I don't have the sophistication of roasting. It's mm -hmm. very sophisticated, sir. You showed me the, the book, the That's log right. book. It's very, very good. We work hard. Oh, you do, and it's successful. And each roaster has their own thing, uh -huh. and I really like how you roast. And obviously, Thanks. every time I go by, it's full. There's yeah. people in there. You can see them in the window. They're having a great time. Yeah. And, and um, so, so this is very helpful. We're talking to people who might be consultants, they might be speakers, they mm. might be coaches, they might be authors, yeah. they might have a product or a service. And so these principles are universally applicable. It's, it's what problem are you solving for people? Or what value do you give people? Mm -hmm. And then we generate revenue because we've been successful at giving people value. Mm -hmm. That's the bottom line. That's right. It, it shows up in a lot of forms, but we, we try to manage people, micromanage people, which you do not do. Mm -mm. Now I heard you also say they're there 30 hours a week and you're there three hours. They're 40 yeah, hours. I mean, some of, some of them, uh, I mean, staff are there. If you think about it, we're open from 7 a.m. to, 11 p.m. every day. Wow. Um, little abbreviated hours on Sundays. 
but um, we close on at 10 o'clock, but my staff are still there closing up until 11. And so you think about that, they're arriving at 620 and there's at least two folks there through the whole day until 11. Uh, usually during lunch hour, there's five. And so <clears throat> the total number of hours my staff put in are hundreds and hundreds of hours a week. I can never learn what the collective staff have learned because of the time they're, they're putting in. So it makes sense for me to, um, to at least be willing to listen and learn from them, excuse me, uh, as, as well as I can. So, uh, so uh, you know, when they have an idea, I don't always run with it, but I always listen to it. And I think that's, that's really important. Absolutely, absolutely. So Abe Lober, um, dear friend here, and I, as you can tell, a very astute businessman. Um, he's not bad at um, helping you look at your future retirement uh, with Northwest. Did I say Northwestern Mutual? You did, yeah, right. You said yeah, they're not one of my sponsors. So I've heard lots of very sound leadership principles, which are right in the wheelhouse of what we teach here. Mm -hmm. um, very clear vision. Yes. for the business, uh, very clear value proposition. This is who we are, very clear branding, mm -hmm. um, very clear directives and culture for the mm -hmm. staff, mm -hmm. uh, for your employees. So they, they represent your brand every mm -hmm. single minute, mm -hmm. every single day. They do. And, um, you hold a vision, but you're not behind the kitchen, behind the, behind the scenes calling all the shots. And I see that a lot yeah. with restaurant owners. Mm -hmm. And that we call over-functioning. And the more we function, over-function, the more they under-function. That's right. So you've, got, you've successfully gotten out of the way because you have some processes in place. Um, so this has been um, really awesome. <laughs> Not only because I agree with you, but it just helps me rethink some of the, the principles. And I'm, I'm, I also heard you say it's the best fish and chips in Lynchburg, and I got to go try it. Oh, you got to try the fish and chips. I, Got to yeah, do that. No, it's very good. I, I will say though, um, I have worked in the restaurant before, mm -hmm. but I don't work in the restaurant. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. that makes sense, I'm mm -hmm. never on the schedule. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I get a phone call from a staff member who says we're slammed and so and so is sick today, what do you want me to do? Uh, I'll say now. Truth be told, I can't pull a great espresso shot. Uh, I don't know how. Uh, I'm not very good at making omelets in the kitchen either. But I'll show up and wash dishes because I know how to do that. Uh -huh. And I'll show up and bust tables because uh -huh. I know how to do that. Uh -huh. And I think it's important that you be willing to do that. Um, and that you occasionally do those hard jobs, those dirty jobs to remind your staff that nobody's above that. And uh, because it's not, it's not a lowly thing. You're still serving people. And, uh, and then the other is, even though I don't work in the restaurant, uh, even if I'm present, if I'm having, me having a meeting with you, they still underperform because I'm present. Mm -hmm. I get all the questions that they would have handled on their own had I not been in the space. And so the best thing I can do for my staff and for my restaurant sometimes is be nowhere near that place. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we forget that we can be incredibly hands off and still allow uh, our businesses, in fact, empower our businesses by doing so to be even more successful and to thrive. Those are really good words. I'd <clears throat> like to give you a minute to think about a closing thought or a tip for people and I'm gonna I'm gonna work in um, a sponsor message here our sponsor uh, for this episode is rock paper simple it's important that you don't just create a pretty website that you create a website that engages people represents your brand and is going to be your marketing engine so if you go to rockpapersimple.com backslash hue there's a page for you to go and Joshua Adams and his highly skilled team much like the team you just heard about today, will give you an assessment of what you want to accomplish and help you get there. They help us, they work on our sites, and they are our vendor of choice. Rock, paper, simple. When you want your website just not to be a pretty picture, but to be an experience that engages your tribe, rockpapersimple.com backslash Hugh. We're wrapping up with Abe Lober today. Abe, uh, works um, in the, the, the team with, uh, he represents Northwestern Mutual, has an office here, which is mm -hmm. a redesigned, refurbished, older building. We have lots of older buildings that have a second life in Lynchburg, and it's right. just stunning. Great, great office space. 
but we've been talking about really sound leadership principles, really good business standards, mm -hmm. and really uh, numbers of success because Abe's been very faithful to what he knows and has figured the rest out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, stumbled through the rest, right? Yeah, I want to ask you one more question before you do your parting thought. But okay. um, when you're growing in different areas of leadership, business, restaurant, um, you don't have to list names, but are there people you reach out to to help you think through strategy, help through mm -hmm. finances? And so you've learned things because you've had mentors in those areas? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. In fact, when it came to choosing our menu, I collected uh, and I collected or gathered the five uh, friends of mine who had what I would consider the, the best palates. And so I took a guy who's just an exceptional home cook, uh, my sister, who's got an incredible ability to, um, she can create a soup from scratch with no recipe and it'll be the best soup you've ever had. And it's whatever happens to be in the, in the refrigerator. She just knows how ingredients will affect you. Uh, and, and a couple of other folks who, who work in wedding planning, who work in uh, different restaurants. And I said, come with me. We're going to, we're going to taste, you know, four different macaroni and cheeses, four different types of bacon, four different burger buns. And we went through this and, and I took their advice on everything because I know what I love, but I don't know what everybody loves. Yeah. And so, so getting a little bit closer to appealing to a larger percentage of our population was really important. Another key point, another soundbite here. You don't sell what you love, you sell what they love. That's right. Absolutely. It's like the golden rule is misinterpreted. It's not we do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You do unto others as they want to have done to them. That's right. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I learned this with my wife because I love a shoulder rub and she hates it. <laughs> so if I, I'll see her and I'll, I'll start massaging her shoulder. She's like, stop, stop, come on. Um, so you, you learn this, that not everybody wants what you want. So yes, do unto others as you would have them, or as, as you, they would have themselves done unto. And you've done a brilliant job of finding out what people want and, and you, you supply that. So as we're wrapping up here, what, mm -hmm. what parting thought or tip would you like to leave with people? Yeah. I learn, and, and by the way, I've had a, all of two minutes to figure this out, but this is what I think I want to leave, <laughs> is that I, I have learned, I, I hear people say a lot, that they need to create some distance between management and employee, ownership and employee. Because if you don't, it becomes especially complicated when you need to let people go mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I understand that there's some wisdom in that. Um, I have found the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, I have my staff to my house for a summer barbecue every year. I have them over for gift exchanges and Christmas parties. And we spend time together. Most of my managers, um, have been to my house, just them and their wife, or just them and, and their fiance or whoever to, to get to know me and my wife, spend time with our family, understand, I think, that they're, they're, these are people. That has not hindered my ability to make good business choices. I think a lot of leaders live in fear that their emotions will get in the way of their good business choices. I think if you're a strong enough leader, you have control of those emotions, you know what you want and what you have to do, and you do the right thing. Uh, you, that shouldn't keep you from growing close to people and, and building relationships. So um, my staff and I have fantastic friendships that I think are, are really valuable to our brand. Awesome. Uh, leadership is based on relationship. Yeah. Communication is founded in relationship. Oh, well, Abe Lober, you've been a blessing today. Thank you so much for being on Orchestrating Success. My pleasure.